Hey everyone, Benji here from the Contractor Evolution Studio. So as you have no doubt already realized, we are in the people-driven industry, right? No matter what kinds of services you provide or what kind of building you work on or fix, at the end of the day, you are trading people's time for money. Artificial intelligence or fancy software isn't plumbing a house or installing a roof yet. So for the time being, the truth remains, we succeed or fail by how our people perform. Well, most of us are familiar with the idea of creating structured roles for the people in our companies. What is often not considered as much is the type of personality that will thrive, truly thrive in that role. In other words, we know what we need someone to do, but who we should go out and find to do it, that's less clear. People are different, right? The personality that makes your project manager extremely good at finishing jobs on budget and on schedule is not the same personality that makes your salesperson close a ton of deals. Understanding different personalities, where they fit, and how to productively work alongside them is beyond vital for us people-driven business owners. And remember this, these dynamics are at play in your business right now, whether you choose to equip yourself with the tools to navigate them or not. And this is why we brought on the show Dr. Ken Keyes. Dr. Ken holds a PhD in leadership and management and is the president of CRG. In over 30 countries, he has helped thousands of leaders understand the interpersonal dynamics in their organizations. Ken is the co-author of the Personal Style Indicator, which is the number one rated personality assessment in the world by participants. This assessment has been used for decades by leaders to better understand themselves first and then their people. The insights and the wisdom gained from Ken's tools allow entrepreneurs to better build teams and get more out of them. In this episode, Ken teaches us about personal styles and why you as a contractor need to understand them. You're watching Contractor Evolution, where we unpack the systems, tactics, and skills you need to take your fast-growing contracting business to the next level. You're here to learn what it takes to scale up, work less, and increase profitability. You've come to the right place. Stay tuned to learn what separates the new breed of contractor from the old school and welcome to your ultimate guide on the business of contracting. All right, Ken, welcome to the show. It's awesome to have you. Well, it's great to be here with you guys. Nice to see you. You too. So in the contracting space, one of the things we know that's that's very prevalent in our industry is the fact that we rely on human labor and, and humans executing what humans do best. This is not a game of technology, of complex machinery. Uh, we work with people. So tell us a bit about what are personality styles? Why are they so fundamental to leadership, especially in the context of our contracting industry? You know, some of you watching might have heard of personal styles or personality. And here's the reality, Igor, every single person on the planet has personal styles, as right. we call it, or personality. So what does that mean? The reason that it's so important for any business, and especially in contracting space, is that I need to know who I am, my team needs to know who they are, and then you also have customers that you're interacting right. as well. So all these multiple relationships are coming together, and why wouldn't I want to manage that intentionally and deliberately and know who I am and know who you are so that I could optimize performance, get the right people in the right jobs, build relationships mm -hmm. in a positive way. Mm. A lot of people like w with, with the personal styles thing, um, I feel like there's sort of a overly simplified version of this. Like there's extroverted and there's, and then there's shy people. And then there's like, um, you know, people that are, have really big brains and they're deep thinkers. And then there's people that aren't so much like that. Like, it, but I, there, there's gotta be more to it than that. Right, Ken? Yeah, well, it's actually one of my pet peeves is when people simplify it and say, well, you're a dog or a cat or some kind of animal. Yeah. And I said, well, excuse me, I think we're slightly more complex right. than that. You know, it's one of the reasons why our personal style indicator is now the number one rated tool globally is we want to honor the complexity that people have. So our definition of personal style is your natural predisposition, meaning you are born with and how you perceive, approach, and interact with the environment, which includes time, people, tasks, and situations. So, I mean, have you ever met somebody that um, no matter what, they always seem to be late and no yes. consciousness of time? And are there some people that no matter what, they there's a snowstorm, there's 12 feet of snow, there's drifts, the highway's closed, and they're still early. Right. So how is that possible? 
So because we are naturally born with differences. You know, if anybody watching has a sibling or uh, two or more kids, are they exactly the same, same parents, same environment? So why are they different? Because we are biologically wired at birth differently. Right. So as a leader in business, why is it so, so important that I, that I understand this very well? Well, because you have people. Mm -hmm. And when we think about how people react, what they do and what they don't do, mm -hmm. a lot of that is influenced by their personal style. Right. So every single person on the planet has a personal style. We've been in 30 countries, 12 different languages. This underpins culture, geography, gender. All of us have personal style, and it's influencing what I do, what I don't do, what my strengths, what my weaknesses are, what I like to do, what I don't like to do. So if I'm not intentional with that, then I'm just sort of an accident. There was a study done by our competitor, Talent Smart. And they said, what percentage of the population will realize their full potential if they don't know their personal style? Mm -hmm. And they said, 2%. 2%? That means 98% of people are not going to realize their potential because they aren't conscious, awake, and aware of personal style or, as other people call, personality. Right. So um, what would be like some obvious examples or, or like dimensions of this personal style framework? And we, we don't need to go crazy deep on it, but for someone that's maybe not um, looked at their own team or their family or their friends or anyone for that matter through this lens, what would be like some, some obvious examples that they could, they could really like understand in concrete language? Well, we use the four dimension model that many other people do, like DISC would do it, or maybe True Colors. But we actually say some of these other ones are party games. You mentioned around it being too simple. So the other side is it's too complex. Right. So there's some assessments out there that you need a PhD to understand what the report is. So one of the things we want people to do is to say, can I actually understand consciously who I am, mm -hmm. what those preferences are, what those mean for me? So in our model, we have four dimensions. So behavioral action, so that's the action-oriented and the driven into person that's that goal-oriented, that sees the results. They're, Get stuff they're done. Yeah, and they're future-oriented. Then we have cognitive analysis, and those people have this ability to have attention to detail, see what's not there, but a lot of times they can live in the past because they can hold grudges right. too. Mm -hmm. uh, but they have this organization or operational side. You have interpersonal harmony individuals who really have this gift of compassion, serving, customer service support. A lot of people that are in the professions of helping professions like counselors, they'll be in that role. Right. And then affective expressive, which is this outgoing people oriented individual. Now you mentioned something earlier, Benji, around introversion, extroversion. We're going to suggest with our work, and we're now 41 years as a company and have proven through over a million people completing our assessment that the global sort of understanding of introversion, extroversion is really incorrect. It does a disservice to a very high percentage of the people. So first of all, those four dimensions that I briefly mentioned, all of us have all four just at different intensities. Mm -hmm. So intensity matters. Like a lot of times there's some assessment says you're uh, extroverted or you're introverted, but there's some of us that are actually quite frankly balanced. Mm -hmm. So our definition of introversion, extroversion is our orientation towards the environment. So extroverts want to tell the environment what to do, how to, they, they see it as something to be engaged, something to be told what to do, something to influence. On the flip side, introverted individuals in our model see the environment where I need to be cautious, I need to be careful. Uh, I will seek the environment and the environment will influence my choices by telling me what to do. Not right, not wrong. And then each of us have different intensities. So we even measure that in our tool where maybe I'm highly extroverted and you're highly introverted or, and then there's some people that are kind of in between mm. and that's okay. Now the other side that it doesn't influence is what we call people and tasks. Most of us that are paying attention or watching this, you know that there are some people that are relationship oriented and some people that are task oriented. And so that is a separate measure and, um, I think it was Blanchard 50 years ago confirmed that in his studies is that, okay, there are just some people that they just want to focus on the people side. And there's some people that just want to focus on the task, mm -hmm. not right, not wrong, just different. Right. And Did, in our industry, we really need a mix of all different kinds of people and all different kinds of personalities. Right. 
Well, that's one of the other reasons. You, you say, why do we have to pay attention to this? Here's why. Who do we tend to like to hang out with? People, people like, like us. us, like us, right? Yeah. right? And who do you need in your company? A lot of times people who are opposite of you, your totally. number one irritant. I mean, those <laughs> of us who, uh, a lot of times there's research, we used to have a counseling division in our company. You marry an opposite because you see the gaps and then that's the number one irritant once you're married, right? So <laughs> same thing on a team is that I maybe have certain strengths, but I want to be able to have somebody else who is balancing me. Yeah. And so we don't want to hire everybody that's like me is most teams need a blend of some type of a mixture of the different dimensions right. yeah. so that they can be successful. But the problem is nobody measures it. They don't pay attention to it. It's not included in how they hire, how they lead. It's just accidental. You would not want a team of a bunch of Benjis. It would be an absolute circus in well, there. It would be awful. Yeah, <laughs> it would be an unmitigated disaster. It'd be fun. Like, it'd be a lot well, of fun. It'd be a good time. It'd be <laughs> a good time, but... <laughs> maybe if I'm starting a circus, maybe I just... You call, you call me. I mean, yeah. my, me and my <laughs> friends will show up. Uh, qu question for you on this stuff. Like, you've, you've talked about these... These There's a few dimensions to this. There's, there's interpersonal. There's... Uh, you say there's some people that are super action-oriented. And I'm sure there's combinations of all of them. Does this stuff change over time or is it is it fairly permanent? So for us, we have a model that talks about the personality development factors. So we have lots of things that input. So the question you're asking, are we nature or are we nurture? Yeah. We're both. So the nature side, and here's why this is so important. So the personal style or other people call personality, we believe stays consistent and does not change throughout your lifetime. Mm -hmm. And here's why this is important. That means that if it wasn't true, tomorrow morning you'd wake up to be somebody different. Igor would be Benji and Benji would be Igor tomorrow morning. Right. So there is a theme, there's an essence, there is these preferences that stay consistent throughout your lifetime. So you can count on you being you. Yeah. Uh, you could imagine that you talk about chaos having all the Benjis. What if Benji changed who Benji was yeah. every single day? So there's this baseline, this foundation that I can build my life on because I can count on me showing up with these preferences. Right, and you can count on the other people in your life to continue to show up the way that they are. Absolutely, so imagine if somebody came in and they're a finishing carpenter and the next day they have to be a framer because they can't finish anything anymore. This, this is not good. However, that being said, we still all mature, we grow, we have experiences. And so I'm not the same person I was 20 years ago. Hopefully I've matured. My mom, who is now 87, says, hey, listen, one day, Ken, you're going to grow up. And I said, maybe, maybe, I, maybe I don't want to. However, that being said is my nature, my drive, how I show up is very consistent from when I was even in high school. Right. And so thank goodness for that. And yet at the same, same time, getting education, getting experience, uh, being mentored by other people, being coached by, you know, mm. companies like BTA or others that then take you to the next level. Those are amazing opportunities to then realize your potential. Because sometimes what happens is that our greatest strength also becomes our greatest weakness. So if you only bring a hammer to the work site and you need a saw... Well, this is not good. So we need to develop inherent flexibility. I'm not changing who you are, but I'm, we're creating this awareness. So there was a study done by Dr. Tasha in Denver. She wrote the New York Times bestseller, Insights. And her study was what percentage of people uh, self, uh, believe that they're self-aware, meaning they, they know how they lead, they know how they come across to customers, they know how they come across to others on their team or even personally. And 95% of the people believe that how they see themselves is how everybody else experiences them. Mm -hmm. Then she had her students go out and do the research, says, okay, let's just check what Benji's friends think about Benji. And do you know that there was only 10% of congruence when people asked the people around them, says that their opinion of self lined up with how everybody else experiences them. 85% of people are delusional. They don't even know that they don't know that they don't know. Right. And so that is one of the reasons why personal style or these assessments or this track is so important so I can open your eyes and say in self-awareness all things are possible the other thing is is what I do and what I don't do is constantly influencing my credibility with everybody I meet so every single person that's ever met you customer employee personal friend there's a level of credibility with you ha you have with them if you like it or not it's the price you pay for showing up mm. but most people don't have a consciousness aren't awake 
to that. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the goals of what we're trying to do here is just to educate people that just take the time to start become becoming or become a student of style. Get aware and understand personality. Know what it is. Start diving into it. I mean, even if you're a tradesperson or a contractor, if this is your first day or your 10th year, your 10th year, you're a little bit better, I would hope, right, right. than your first day. So if you become a student of style, then all of a sudden it's just like riding a bike. It's just this natural sort of focus and say, oh, that's, I need to consider that mm -hmm. in all my relationships and interactions with all the people I'm working with. Right. Okay. So on that topic, business owners in the contracting space, what do you find they commonly kind of get wrong when it comes to personality style? Well, one of the things we were talking about off camera was, is first of all, they dismiss this stuff. Right. <laughs> like it does, it's not even a thing. It's not even a thing. So you know, what's, the, yeah, what's the personality of your team? Wait, what are you talking about? We just got to get to work. No, 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 no. I, I want to yeah. know that that person has got his ticket. Yeah. Or she's got his, she's got her ticket. So the first the thing is that discounting this information, that, that is just, first of all, they've got that wrong. Number two is, is doing a cursory visit said, oh yeah, I did that thing 10 years ago. Right. <laughs> okay, well, so you know what? I worked out 10 years ago. Guess what? I'm not fit anymore. Right. <laughs> so if you work out every week, then you are continuing to be fit. So the second one is, is that they, if you do it, you need to make it part of your culture. You need to be part of the essence of your standard <laughs> SOPs, right? Standard operating procedures. Right. It's something you do. It's our most successful organizations that have been using our tools are the ones that make it part of their fabric. It's just what they do with everybody all the time. It's a powerful tool and a process so that they won't be this 98% of people that won't realize the mm -hmm. potential without mm -hmm. that knowledge. And what does it look like when they are doing it well, when you think of some very high performing Breakthrough Academy members that work with you and that work with CRG, what, what are these kind of things that they're doing on a regular basis where it's almost like SOP like, if you will, within their organization? Well, it's interesting. A lot of times you get into organizations, not even just contracting, but any company. So, well, just, just the leaders are going to take it. Right. Well, hang on. Right. Uh, aren't they interacting with the team members? And so it's interesting. I, you know, I've been around CRG now for 30 years, even though it's been around for 41, and I bought it 20 years ago. And when I first bought it, most people think they take these personality, quote unquote, tests to learn about other people. But what I really discovered, it's to learn about yourself. Right. So as a leader, as a leader, as an individual, as a team player, and there are multiple reasons why. If I know who I am, my ability to say no is equally important as my ability to say yes. There's a lot of times that people are promoted. In fact, I was on a call with one of your members just last week around says, I'm really struggling with this individual who I put in charge of this team. And I said, has he ever led before? No. Do you know how he's leading? No. <laughs> so all the, so this individual was a very good at doing his contracting work, but leading other people is a different skill set. Right. So the ones that are most successful, are the ones that they, they see it as a very powerful tool to contribute to clarity, mm -hmm. contribute to understanding self. And so when I know who I am, there's all this, you know, in this professional development space, everybody's talking about strengths. Right. Yeah. So I need to play to my strengths and developing my weaknesses is highly overrated, but I need to know what they are. But not only do I need it for myself, I need to know my teams. Now, if my team members know what their strengths are, I am actually equipping them. I'm helping them to be engaged. I am empowering them to be successful. Because if I'm the only one that's taking the assessment, you haven't really helped the team members mm -hmm. because you need to understand what the team members are doing and who they are as much as yourself. So this goes both ways. It's sort of like I go for couples therapy and you take the assessment and I don't. <laughs> right. Well. Because you need it and I don't. Well, that no, no, hang on. That doesn't work. So the organizations that uh, permeate and have all, all the sort of the core team members, uh, maybe seasonal workers don't take it. Maybe they do. But all the people that are around the company, they know who each other persons are. Mm -hmm. We have them go through their in-depths. Now, you said something a, f a few minutes ago, Benji, about, you know, maybe there are a percentage of this, a percentage of that. It's the blend of our dimensions that's most important. Mm. So a lot of times people talk about, oh, you're this, you know, dominator kind of type. Well, here's the reality. 90% of the population of a blend of these four different dimensions that we have. And in fact... 30% or three or four are balanced. 
And so that messes with people to try to describe myself as a lion or a dog or a cat does a disservice to 90% of the population. So when I know what my blend is and I know how it shows up, one of the things we teach people, not only do I go through my in-depth and I start owning myself, in other words, the self-awareness side, I get you to read my in-depth because I need you to understand who I am. So one of your members on a call just the other day uh, was talking about, you know what? This personal style indicator has saved uh, an employee. She was going to quit. She was my operations person. She hated me. <laughs> this is the owner saying, because right. I gave her no time to listen to her. I was always going, was the next project <laughs> on and on. I was going and I didn't stop to really listen to her. And I was, you know, you know, my book is called, why aren't you more like me for a reason is that he was, you know, why don't you lead the way that I follow? So she was, he was not leading the way that she was willing to follow. And he says, you have saved a relationship. She understands me that I wasn't waking up in the morning to irritate you. See, people don't judge you by your intentions. They judge you by your behaviors. Yeah, right. So what you do and what you don't do. So when Brendan and I first got married, Brenda's my wife, and we're now married uh, nearly 30 years when we're taping this. And we had married maybe three months and she was a, a, a school instructor at the college. She was doing English as a second language. And I was sitting at our kitchen table, which was a townhouse with a window looking to the carport. She pulled into the carport. We're only married three months. I may be reading the paper at the kitchen table. She gets out of the car. Her arms are full of books. And she opens the door, and she's mad with me. Why, Benji? I didn't, didn't get up and the open books. the door, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. Was I even thinking about it? You know, Giving me the consciousness that I'm even awake? So, so that's the sin of omission. So I didn't get up and open the door. Can I be conscious, awake, and not self-centered? So the, the opposite side and one of the values of understanding personal style is we are all inherently self-centered. We're all inherently mm -hmm. biased. And so we get frustrated. We get upset. We have conflict. I know you wanted to talk about that as we go through it because we judge what other people should or shouldn't do based on our preferences, not theirs. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, do, I do that pretty much yeah, every yeah, that's day. Right. Yeah. And so we actually have a three-step process. We talk about building credibility with others. So first one is, you know, we teach people how to read other people, not from a manipulative point of view, but paying attention. And then the next one we talk about, and I believe this is the most difficult step, we call it suspending or actually putting on hold or in neutral your needs in deference for yours. Right. It's the opposite of being self-centered. Man, that is the hardest thing as human beings to do because everybody wants their agenda, their drive, mm. what's important to them. So I'm not asking you to change your personality or personal style. I'm asking you to put it in neutral because you want to optimize the performance and engagement of this person. And then the third step is what we call style shifting is now that I am a student of style, I know what Igor needs from me right now. Mm -hmm. And so I will adjust my behavior, my approach, uh, my interaction with you to meet your needs rather than mine. Now, interesting, you know what happens? Then my needs are met. Right. Because I met your needs. So your member who was talking to me, and I'm not going to mention his name, he said, now we have a, the best relationship that we've ever had. Now, the other one that you were talking about was hiring, right? So I'm just, I'm thinking about this uh, Zoom call that we're on and this other member was mentioned. He says, you know what, Ken? I was going to hire this person and I tend to always hire the people that are like me. So he's a little bit like you, Benji. Yeah. Sort of this outgoing, this energized person and not really attention to detail, right? This driven. How dare yeah, you? That, yeah, I'm, so what are, you <laughs> are you serious? How dare you? Well. <laughs> The fact that you're laughing about yeah. it, you're laughing at yourself right now. So that's okay. It takes one to know one. Yeah. So one of the things that he uh, said, he says, you know what? Always in the past, I was hiring other people. And this individual I hired, and it said, she's the best operations person that we have ever had. And he said, and if it wasn't for the personal style indicator, he says, I would have never done it. I would never would have done it. Now, as you know, this is one of your more successful members. Mm -hmm. This is not just a little tiny company. He's got, you know, dozens of staff because he hadn't been doing it. He hadn't been using this information. And then what he did is he had his entire team go through one of the online courses mm -hmm. just to start going deeper. It says, let's, let's all do this together. Let's find out about who Benji is, who Igor is. Let's have some fun with this. Let's enjoy this. And, oh, Ken, you're like that. Oh, you're kind of a jerk. Yeah, I am. That's fine because I'm impatient. I'm not waiting for you. I'm interrupting you. And so you have some understanding that I didn't wake up this morning with the intention to offend you. Right. I woke up this morning and I'm just self-centered. 
Yeah. And I'm doing my thing. I'm not waking. Maybe I got a lot of projects on my mind, lots of things that are kind of distracting me is that I need to slow down. Everybody talks about this mindfulness now too. And I need to slow down and say, okay, my behavior is constantly having an impact. Um, do I even know what that is? Right. I, I don't, I don't think most people do. And my, my sense having just li- listened um, to you even just for the last few minutes here is that like a, a lot of these tools, a lot of this work gives you, it's almost like putting on a magic set of glasses where you like w- without them, you're looking at people and they're these like little two dimensional stick men with no color. And then you put it on and you see 4k full HD. You understand uh, somebody in all their dimensions in relation to time like it's so much richer of a picture mm-hmm. that you're looking at other people and yourself with right so that that i think is is a hugely hugely powerful um thing to adopt particularly in this space where there's so much like well they're good enough yeah. it's a warm body we'll just check them on site and like ho- hopefully that works so we really need an office manager and you know this person says they've done it for a year for another company like there, you, there's there's a lot of that that goes on and i feel like this is uh an antidote to it now i want to get into recruiting conflict there's a few things I, I think that this stuff applies to very well but there's something you said a few minutes ago um that i i don't want to uh just skip past you said developing your weaknesses is highly overrated what do, you, what do you mean by that? Well, if, uh, so we were joking about you and your attention to detail, yeah. right? So or I said, thereof. you know, <laughs> lack thereof. To expect you to be the auditor of our company and now put you in the bookkeeping role and the data analysis role. I already have anxiety. Okay. <laughs> it, it is, it's not a fair expectation. So part of what we've already discussed, and so this might be a long answer to a short question is the reason I need to understand myself and to say no is a lot of times people are given, let's say, an opportunity or promoted, and now components of the job no longer fit who they are because people believe that ambition is equal to upwardly mobile. That's not necessarily true or added responsibilities. Mm. Those added responsibilities might not be a fit for you. So I need to be conscious and awake and aware of my uh, weaknesses and don't use my style for an excuse for my behavior. So because you don't have an attention to detail doesn't mean you can't, you, you are not responsible for your expense report. Totally. You still need, to, still need to do it. However, the majority of the role and responsibility here isn't going to be around that. So we always have stuff in our jobs and roles in companies that we don't like doing. Mm-hmm. But how can I mitigate that and lower that? And here's why. When I start doing things that is not my strength, I drain my energy. So then I don't have stuff left for what I love doing, what I enjoy doing. You know, uh, Igor and I were having a conversation at lunch about, you know, we lost our operations manager Mm -hmm. a year ago, and she was with me for 30 years, attention to detail. And then all of a sudden it started to land on my plate Mm -hmm. because there was nobody else to replace it. You know what? I was stressed. I was stressed. So being responsible, say, okay, I want to play to my strengths. I want to create a company and a team where most of the people within the organization are playing to their strengths Mm -hmm. as much as possible. Now, that's not always possible to the degree you'd like to, but can I be intentional to go down that pathway? The other thing that's important is, let's say I have a larger team. Let's say there's six, seven, eight people on the team, and we have a conversation about who's going to do what. And I say, oh, Benji, by the way, you're going to do this. And then Benji says, because he knows his style, he says, no, I'm not going to do that. Well, Ecor's on the team says, who does Benji think he is? That prima donna kind of, you know, who does he think he is? He said, no, no, Benji doesn't have that in his style. He's saying no, because it's going to do a disservice to him, a disservice to the team. In three months from now, you're going to be frustrated with him because he's not going to be delivering on what you've asked him to do. So now we can have a conversation as an organization, as a team, as with leaders, so that I can play for the most part to my Mm. strengths. So, so let me ask you this, like if, if, if you're just, um, an individual that is, ambitious and wants to grow and wants to achieve their potential. And and let's say for the sake of this hypothetical question, you have a finite amount of personal development effort you can put into your life. Like, are you better served to work on your weaknesses so that they become your, your averages, or are you better to like put that into your strengths so that they become super strengths? Do you see what I'm asking? I do. And I'm thinking I'm being thoughtful about how I want to respond to that. And, 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 and I appreciate the question. 
I would still say that for the most part, I, I said this earlier, your greatest strength can also be your greatest weakness if you're not in charge of it. Mm-hmm. So if I'm driven and I'm decisive and I'm goal oriented, but I treat my staff impatiently, because every strength has a related weakness, by the way, right. Right? every strength has a related weakness. So if I can temper that side of the strength, then yes. On the other hand, you're never going to make me an auditor and you're not going to be an auditor ever. Totally. And so a lot of times when we're growing up is, you know, my dad uh, said, you remember this old saying that parents used to say, I'm not sure if you guys are old enough. Kids are to be seen, not heard. Who's, who thought that up? I don't know. So my dad says, you, you talk too much, can you? You know, you, and so now I speak for a living, you know, all around the world. So, hello. So, but my self-worth really struggled. And so what we want to encourage, if we have this high performance organization and team, you want to create a, an environment or culture where people can clearly articulate, this is not my strength, Igor. Mm-hmm. If you're asking me to do this, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I know that you're the leader here. You're asking me to do this. But if you understand style and this is my style and this is the nature of this work and it's not a fit, you know it's a disservice to you and to me. Mm -hmm. And so the other thing is a lot of times when people don't know this information, they then get guilty, they shame themselves. They uh, said, man, if I would just apply myself, if I just had more willpower. I tried harder. Yeah, tried harder. Now, it doesn't mean that work's not hard. I mean, I grew up on a dairy farm. I understand what hard work is about. On the other hand, if there's not some kind of flow, not some kind of inspiration, not some kind of energy that you get from the work that you do and your responsibilities from a day-to-day basis, you're probably in the wrong spot. Totally. Maybe from a purpose point of view, but also from a style point of view. You know, the, la- the stat from Gallup was, it was the largest study in history of engagement of workers, 142 countries. Do you know that the global workforce engagement is only 13%? I mean, that, that, means like that, that means 90% of the population dislike what they do for mildly irritate the loathe. And there's fully a quarter of the population who are actively disengaged. What that means is they're sabotaging everybody else who is happy. So the highest engagement in the world was U.S. and Canada at 29%. Most of Europe, most of Asia is single digits. Mm-hmm. Six, seven, eight, nine percent of the population that like what they do. Right. So in North America, what we're saying is we're leading the world, but still two thirds of employees are very disengaged. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's, let's take a moment and talk then a bit about recruiting. Cause one of our biggest jobs as leaders and contracting businesses is to bring in the right kind of people and to put them on the right seat of the bus, so to speak. So um, this understanding of personal style, how does it play into recruitment selection and forming of teams? Like what do people need to be doing? Well, first of all, as a company ourselves, we haven't hired anybody without this information for 20 years. Mm -hmm. We just don't do it. So, I mean, if you went to your doctor, and so we're across this, 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 call this a treatment table, and you said to me, Dr. Ken, what's, what's my blood pressure? And I said, well, Igor, I think you're 120 over 80, but I didn't put the blood cuff on your arm. You think right. I'm a quack, right? <laughs> right. Like, what kind of doctor are you? Like, you want to know, I'm just, I'm just oh, I, oh, yeah, I, yeah, I can see, I can envision who you are. Hold, well, hold if, if, we, if we don't accept that from medical professionals, why would we accept it in the hiring process? Right. So we go and we go ad hoc. We were uh, talking earlier that most people will have some kind of opinion about the person within seven to 15 seconds. And then of the meeting ne- them. Of meeting them. And then you'll rationalize that for the next 30 minutes about why I should or shouldn't hire uh, Benji. So what you're you're saying, I want to capture that like within whatever, 10 to 15 seconds, most hirers, most interviewers, most contractors make up a decision about whether or not they like this person for their team. And then they spend the rest of the interview just rationalizing that, that choice. Absolutely. And the other thing that happens around hiring and why you want to use this, and this was, you know, we were talking earlier about this other member who hired this operations person who's just rocking it. And he said in the past, I was always hiring the wrong person because of hiring people like me versus what the position needs is most people don't take the time, uh, contractors, owners, business owners, and determine what does the position need from a personality point of view? Mm-hmm. So in other words, stop thinking about the person. What what are the roles and responsibilities of the position? 
Are you clear? So we have one of our tools where multiple people, so let's say the three of us are on a hiring committee and we fill out this assessment, it's called the job style, on the position. We say, this is what we believe this operations person or this salesperson or whatever the, the position is requires. And you have an opinion, I have an opinion, you have an opinion, and then the report brings it up. You know what happens most of the time? The three of us have different opinions. Mm. So how could, you know, even if there's just two of you, how could we hire the right person if the three of us can't even come to an agreement about who we want to hire? Right. Now, that's the purpose of the tool is that Benji has a perspective, you have a project, perspective, I do, probably not, not of it's wrong. It's just saying, why do you believe we need that in that position? So they haven't totally. taken that time in advance to really be thoughtful about the roles and responsibilities. Now, all right. the standard things that you teach at BTA around hiring the right person, around skill sets and, you know, interviewing skills and all these uh, qualifications, you know, can they even swing a hammer is still needed. But what is that nature of that person mm -hmm. to be able to fill that out? Now, from there, can I start to remove as much bias as possible? It's called implicit bias. All of us have it from the interview where these assessments help to understand who you are as part of the conversation. Right. And one of the things that a lot of tools don't do is to measure sort of what we call inherent style flexibility. So you can bring, knowing who you are from a style point of view or personality point of view, let's say on our second interview, is that then I can bring um, questions that are relative to who you are and your preferences, both strengths and you talked about challenges. So yes, I need a foreman out or a site supervisor who's going to get things done, take charge, uh, overcome any kind of challenges that are on the site because stuff happens. Yet, don't tick off my entire team so they quit. Right. So I build my conversations Says, listen, where have you demonstrated tolerance and patience when things have gone wrong and, the, and you've still supported your team? Totally. So you now bring that into that. Now, Every, as I mentioned before, every single style has related strengths and weaknesses. So there are some individuals who are very interpersonal and they're very giving towards other people, but they actually avoid conflict. So, uh, you know, when we think about I'm a leader and all of a sudden uh, I have somebody who's toxic on the team, never underestimate the toxicity that one person can have for the whole team. So instead of dealing with Benji's behavior, I just let it go. So my new policy is I don't have a policy because I've allowed you to do whatever you do. And so everybody else is quitting. My A stars are quitting because I've let the C player right. hang out. Right. One point I love there is, and, and we see this all the time, um, a business owner will say, hey, I need a production manager. And here's the things that they need to technically know in their background. But that question of what is the personality that we need here isn't asked. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's not at all. It's, it's, there's basically a few boxes they need to check on a piece of paper. And in an hour long interview, they're like, wow, you've, okay, you worked for that company before. Got it. Okay. And you have yeah. these tickets. Okay, cool. You, can you drive a truck? Okay. Got it. Yeah. And it's, it's, you it's never, that, you that, don't consider the, the person. Yeah. That, that's the two dimensional stick person analysis that I think, totally. that I think uh, a, a lot of us get wrong or ha have gotten wrong. Um, I want to ask you, so that those are some really phenomenal points about recruitment and team building. Here's another um, part of business and leadership I think this stuff applies to. There is an inherent amount of conflict that just runs mm -hmm. through any business. Mm. People have different opinions about what to do and a decision needs to be made. Uh, different personalities can kind of like rub on each other like oil and water. Um the, the pressures that, that go, like the, the goals, the, the intensity can, can weigh on people. Um, anybody that's been in business for any period of time knows that you're going to lock horns with people and other people in your team are going to do that with each other as well. Um, we, I mean, Breakthrough Academy and Contractor Evolution, we, we've talked before about like, like conflict is very healthy when managed properly. A, a company without conflict is not a good place to be. But when it comes to these moments where we're like, oh man, I can't stand this person. How does this stuff help us navigate that? Well, again, personal style is one part of who I am, right? Um, there is still the nature nurture. <laughs> mm -hmm. If you grew up in a family that was disrespectful, uh, you know, I have a Hungarian background, which is a little bit like the Italian. So if you argue loud, then that's sort of... You've won. Yeah, you've won. That's You've given that. However, 
Uh, that being said, so you have this sort of family of origin and what you grew up and what was modeled for you. But a lot of times, as we said before, because we're inherently self-centered, meaning I judge what you should be doing or not be doing based on my personal style, that is contributing to that conflict. So uh, true story, when we, when we would uh, counsel couples, when we are counseling division, they don't usually, people don't come in for marriage counseling because they're having a great time. <laughs> <laughs> it's usually conflict, right? And so what we would do is we, we, it was required. They had to, both of them had to complete the personal style indicator before we would work with them. And here's why. We wanted to redirect this negative energy that was towards each other to this piece of paper. Right. And we wanted to go in and said, you know, Ken is like that because that is how he was born. Now, he's not conscious and awake. He's oblivious mm. to his behavior. But he didn't, again, wake up this morning to kind of irritate you. The other thing that we teach people around suspending, and this is true for me, because one of the things that I've just probably managed in the last 10 years is that I got so angry and upset with suppliers and vendors who didn't deliver. Mm -hmm. And I'd flame broil them. And then what happened is, is that I didn't have a relationship back and I could, uh, or I don't, left, and I couldn't go back to them for business anymore. <laughs> so when we think about managing self, one of the things that uh, there's, Dr. David Burns has this a book called Feeling Good. And this goes back to that step I talked about, which was suspending. I'm not saying that what you did was okay. I'm not saying that what you did was appropriate. But if I get ramped up, if I lose my cool, then I'm no longer rational. So Dr. Gottman in Seattle, Washington created the Love Lab. Now, it's not what you think, Benji. Okay, these are couples <laughs> that have conflict. And what he did is he videotaped them. And what he proved in his research is that as soon as I go over 100 beats per minute, non-athletic, I'm no longer rational. Like your heart rate. Your heart rate. when you go Because you have this flush of chemicals and your reptilian mind kicks in. So part of this conflict is, I'm, I'm, I agree with you, differences of opinion and conflict. If there's nobody pushing back in your company, this is not a good culture. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. they're not giving you what's really going on. They are just sort of avoiding you rather than, than being a contributor. However, I can have these differences. I can have this interaction with you. I, I can have this quote unquote conflict as long as I don't lose it. Right. If I lose it, then it's then I'm breaking relationship. You've seen this in a grocery store with a four year old who has taken out a parent and says, you keep acting like that. I'll leave you here. Well, they're not going to leave them there. They're saying things that they don't that they regret. And, those, and a lot of times we say that the people we love the most, the ones that we're closest to. So in a work environment, how can I stay grounded and centered? Maybe I'm, I'm happy. Maybe I'm even a little bit angry, but I'm not going to let myself go over 100 beats per minute because of what you did. And so we can still have this conversation. Now, there are some styles, they withdraw as part of the conflict. Yeah. So, and so the interpersonal harmony, who are these nice, cute, fuzzy bear people, right? They're the, actually the ones who in invented the word sabotage. So they're passive aggressive. And so you've really ticked somebody off in your company. This is a support person. <laughs> and they're letting the air out of your tires after you leave. You know, the, and, it's, it's, and they're, no, oh, and they said, you know, call that contractor. See, you'll be there. No, I'm not going to call anybody. And you show up and they're not ready for you. And so why, oh, I don't know. I must have forgot. I don't know. And so now this passive aggressive side's coming out. So right. every style has its related way that it responds to conflict. And then there are some like the high cognitive analysis individuals because they see what's not there. And let's say there's 100 words in an essay, 99 spelled right, one spelled wrong. Which one do I point out? The one that's wrong, right? So if I'm in a relationship and on a team and I'm constantly showing you and talking to you about your deficiencies, but I'm never affirming the positive side, then how's that going to go? Yeah. So when we talk about communications, conflict, it's all these interdispersed pieces. Or as I said earlier, the interpersonal harmony individual who uh, doesn't deal with the team member who is actually stirring up conflict and was disrespectful to me. And I said, hang on, Benji, uh, you know, I appreciate your content is fine, but how you approached it and how you said it was disrespectful. And that's not how we operate here in this company. And so that is very difficult for certain styles. You know, the affect of expressive person could be making all these promises and mm. never uh, keeping them. So they tend to overpromise, under deliver. Yeah, I'll get a, a hold of that. I'll, I'll catch that. And so then they get into trouble with conflict because they, they like to be liked, even though they come across very competent. 
They like to be liked, but I'll just say something to appease you so that you still like me, even though I know that the moon, the stars, and everything in the world has to line up to deliver that four o'clock yeah. uh, deadline. It's not going to happen, right? Sounds familiar. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. very real. Yeah, so to understand conflict and how to work through conflict, you also have to understand personality style. 100%. Well, yeah, absolutely. Totally. And, and then be in charge of it. So there was this study done that... Dr. Ray Williams, who is a friend of mine, a colleague, he writes for Psychology Today, and he's talked about what are the three skills that leaders need to be successful? So number one is self-awareness, which we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. But number two, which is what we're talking about right now, is self-management. Right. <laughs> so if I know I'm a jerk and I'm still a jerk and I act like a jerk and continue to treat you like I'm a jerk, I'm still a jerk. So <laughs> I'm self-aware. And I'm and we're congruent. But I, I could be a jerk. jerk. But I could be a jerk. But if I know... And I act according, like, and I act with that knowledge. It's different. It's different. So step number two is self-management right. and self-mastery, meaning I'm in charge of self. Yes, I know I could be that way, so let me temper that. Let me manage that. Let me be intentional with my behaviors. And then the third one is a deep understanding of other people. Everybody talks about emotional intelligence, interpersonal skills. That's what we're talking about. You know, and if your business never has people in it, you're fine. If you're if you're Tom Hanks and Castaway, then you're good. You don't you don't need this show. But if you have anybody that you have to interact with, customers, suppliers, people that work for you, guess what? It's got to has to include personal style. Yeah. It has to. Yeah, I love it. So good. So um, good. Um, can I ask a question here? Yeah. So we've been talking a lot about conflict and stuff. I I, I love this conversation. I want to talk about if you're running a really high performing team. Things are going super well. Um, the business is growing effectively. Results are awesome. I really want to fine tune this performance culture. I want people to play into their strengths. I want us to work cohesively together. What are some of the practical things I could and should be doing as a leader to further kind of foster that culture? Well, one of the things that our tools do is that you want to not create a codependent relationship. So in other words, there's assessments that, okay, only me, the person who gave you the test can tell you who you are. You want to equip people so that they have their own self-awareness. So uh, we've already touched on that, but I just want to go a little bit further with it, is that you want to create an interdependent or an independent sort of culture, is that I own my stuff. Yeah. So if I'm a team that's high performing, I own my stuff, but I also have given you permission to help me to understand my stuff as well. I've had the privilege of being in New York in trade center number seven, building number seven with Dr. Marshall Goldsmith, the number one executive coach in the world, mm. an invite only event. And he said, one of the things that people, that shocks leaders, and he was, he's just retired, but he was coaching the top CEOs of the Fortune 500 uh, or the top 500 uh, CEOs. And what they really discovered, and they who he would be hired to be the coach, is that his process was feedback. He would get feedback from all the stakeholders around them and said, okay, how is Igor showing up? So I'd interview um, Benji confidentially. What does Igor do well? What does he not do well? If you were to e improve Igor's performance, what would you suggest to him? And so we do the stakeholder feedback of maybe 10 or a dozen people around these larger organizations and then give this back to the individual. Now, here's what the leader had to do. <laughs> this is the hardest thing. When we shared this, oh, by the way, um, Benji, you don't listen to people when you're in a team meeting. You interrupt them and you cut off their thoughts. This is what Benji has to say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You can't refute it. You can't. Uh, push back on it. You just the highest you. performer leaders receive it and say, thank you. They don't defend their behaviors because perception is all there is. And then as a follow-up for this high performance is that I then check in, you know, Benji, one of the things I'm working on as a leader based on the feedback process that we we're doing and we did the personal styles. And one of the things that we learned is that I was not listening is that how am I doing on that? And then what I do is I ask Benji, not for feedback, but what we call feed forward. If I was to interact with you differently so that we could improve our performance, what one suggestion would mm. you have for me? Mm. And so I'm moving towards something versus this defensiveness that you can get into, you know, performance reviews right. and the kind of the old broken models. I want to be able to say, okay, here's the reality of what's going on. 
but where am I moving towards? Right. What could you do? What could you do? What could I do so that we can improve our relationship and our team? F- feedback is is sort of saying like, don't do this. Feed forward is saying, do do, do that. Exactly. It's, it's 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 positive reinforcement. You're kind of painting a picture for the desired behavior rather than just like pointing out the flaws. Right. So it's a lot more actionable. Right. And this other side around the confidential feedback is really to do benchmark to say. This is the condition that we're in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like when you have some new members come in and BTA and they say, well, just uh, give us your books and let's take a look at it. Books? What are you talking about books? Give us your quoting system. Quoting system? What are you, what, right. <laughs> you, know, right. what are you talking about? Yep. I, I don't have any of that. What, what are you talking about? So, I mean, we all, as you know, business owners, you know, our systems always could be improved. But if you don't have it, how can you even implement it? It's just like it's, it's not there. Again, it's the sin of omission. Totally. Yeah. It's good. Any any other questions? No, this is awesome. So I just wanted to confirm. So so coming back to the question, high performing team, we want to fine tune it even further, drive this performance culture. We want to give our people the self responsibility and the accountability to take this into their own hands to to really understand their own personality styles and how they interact with the rest of the team. And you as a leader, there's an opportunity to have uh, greater feedback or feed forward um, kind of understanding from your whole team as a collective. Collect, absolutely. And including all the team members too. Totally. Because high performance team is team. It's not just the leader, it's all the members as well where you would do the similar sort of activity with them. Yeah, there's so it's so fascinating. I mean, if, if, if for the people who do really want to dive into this, there truly is an endless world mm-hmm. to pursue here. And it's, and it's very interesting to observe that for most they don't even get into it whatsoever. Like we just, we got to go paint the house. Totally. Totally. Well, the last research was globally, like in the developed world, 70% of the population don't even know anything about this. Yeah. And when you think about this space, this is a space I think that is underserved with this information. Completely. Oh, so they've been doing technical stuff. You know, if I go into, like we have some clients that have 25,000 employees and they have an HR director and a training director. That might not be the case in all the companies here that are watching this is that the larger they are, usually they have this section. But if they're a smaller organization, even less than 500 employees, it just doesn't always happen. I remember having a client $150 million a year. They hadn't done training in 20 years, mm-hmm. totally. like zero, none. And the, and the managers couldn't figure out why they all hated each other. And I yeah. said, well, you, you haven't talked to each other. You've been abusive to each other. Yeah. You've just been so busy being busy that you haven't worked on yourself. Uh, there's a statement we use in our three-day or our four-day certification that uh, professionals attend. My ability to serve others is equal to or less than my own development. Right. If I'm not developed, how can I coach you? If I'm the leader and I don't know how to lead somebody, how can I help you to lead other people? I can't. Yeah. I don't have those skills. Yeah, 100%. And I think what the, the right mind frame on this for smart entrepreneurs in the contracting space is to understand that, hey, I'm going to lead teams and work with teams and assemble teams and drive performance culture for the rest of my career. If you're an entrepreneur in the contracting space, you're a leader of people right? This is, this is people driven stuff we're talking about. We're talking about like making and maintaining homes. And, uh, and to that, this is all such a core part of your, of your tool belt and your skill sets. These dynamics, this stuff is happening, whether you choose to become aware of it or not. not. And I think (laughs) what you said about it being underserved is absolutely true. That's been my experience. Um, working in this space which is why we wanted to have you on and and give everyone a little bit of a dose but if somebody did want to take this a step further and and really take this Mm. take this work seriously how would they go about finding more about you finding more about crg and and the work you guys do well our website is crgleader.com and all our tools we don't we don't require certification you can go on this very moment onto the site purchase an assessment and take and it's there in your your digital dashboard. You can send it out to your employees. It's there. Or if you want to find out more about myself, it's Ken Keys, K-E-N-K-E-I-S.com. Awesome. And I love it. And we've got a couple of books here. I love the title of this top one. Why yeah, aren't you go. more like me? Why aren't you more like me? By Dr. Ken Keys. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, Ken, it's been so good to have you on the show today. Thank you so much. Fascinating discussion. And, uh, and one that, you know, we would really encourage people to dive further into this world. Like Benji says, whether you're aware of it or not, it is happening in your business as we speak. Thank you. Thanks guys. Hey, if you enjoyed this show, hit that subscribe button. It's what allows us to produce more awesome content for you 
totally for free.